grew up in India, and they decide there when you are born who you are going to be. Okay, so I had three choices: become a doctor, become an engineer, or a failure. Three choices. So I thought about it. Nobody wants to be a failure, so I certainly don't want to be a failure. I wanted to be a doctor. And I didn't like biology. So I guess you can't become a doctor without doing biology. I can't think of myself dissecting a frog or something like that. So I said, I can't do any of these two. So I became an engineer by default. <laughs> Anyhow, along the way, I got fascinated by engineering. Because I saw engineers are dreamers. They look at things. They imagine things, <coughs> and they create things from their imagination. They get inspiration from various places, but they tend to build things. I like to break things apart. It's not like dissecting a frog. It is actually mechanical dissection. I like mechanical dissection, because there's nobody to complain, right? <laughs> if something goes wrong. <laughs> so I was good with that. So I was fascinated, and, um, and I, I, I look at it. I mean, think about it. I don't know how many of you personally know an engineer. But if you think about it, just a typical day in your life, when you get up, you may use a toothbrush. You never think about it, but someone has designed it. There is quite a bit of engineering in it. Someone has helped to build it. It's not the toothpaste, but your clothes. It's not some designer designed it for you. Engineers made it for you. Bicycles, quite a bit of engineering. The buildings, the houses that you live in. Don't forget the cell phones and, and internet and laptops. Everything that you see, you consume, you use as engineering. In fact, if I take those things away from you, you will be back in story. Okay? So I am a proud engineer. And then things happen. You see a lot of things that you have not seen. But at the same time, people talked about design. How do engineers design? Engineers design because there's a need. So, so the design itself has made our life much easier than ever before. Because you have all these goodies, all these gadgets, you know, all of us have lots of different things. We buy a lot of things, we use a lot of things, we toss a lot of things. So the life is very convenient for us, but is it sustainable? And what is sustainability, by the way, anyway? Because it means different things to different people. Sustainability is based, in my opinion, on the fact that everything that we need for our survival depends on our natural environment. And any sustainability approach that we develop must create conditions in which humans and nature can exist in productive harmony. Now, all these greatness I talked about in the end isn't doing that. I'm not sure about that. So let's take a look at, I mean, the design that we do. The design that engineers do is, I would call it, Human-centered design. It's kind of a nice name. It used to be called customer-centered design. And human-centered made it a little bit more human. Although I doubt that human-centered design, if it really serves all humans, or maybe a particular group of people based on income level, or maybe maybe their ethnicity, or, or gender, I'm not sure. But in anyhow, human-centered design, it is still, it sounds good. It seems to be doing what it's supposed to be doing. And, and, how do we, and we are very successful in that process. And if you look at the design process, how engineers are at these designs? Well, they are problem solvers. Engineers are problem solvers. You give them a problem, they will solve it. In fact, Janine was talking about design. Can you design a spring? You saw the beautiful slide. What came to her mind? A spring. <laughs> That's the difference between an engineer and other people. I was thinking about a spring. You were thinking about seasons, right? <laughs> right? So, so engineers, I am involved in problem. We think different, OK? So somebody talked about I'm stressed out. I think about stress levels in the material. So, so, so engineers are, uh, you know, we are in our own world. So give me a problem, I'll solve it. I don't care if the problem is valid or even not many times. So that's a narrow approach, and that is serving us very well because we are single-minded focused in getting things done. So that's what problem-solving approach is and what it has led to. And by the way, the problem-solving approach is also what we try to do is to maximize something. Max 
maximize profit, minimize loss, maximize um, speed, minimize drag, um, maximize air rate or airflow. So we try to get the best maximum out of something. That's an engineering design process we use. And now we look at the design process. He actually takes engineering data that we are comfortable with, converts into drawings, converts into pictures. And those are the cell phones, by the way. I'm sure every one of us have a bunch of them <coughs> lying around somewhere. Those are the cell phones. And I'm not sure if you can see it. These are the cell phone chargers that we use. <laughs> OK? These are all bullet casings, thousands, thousands of them. And these are all just in one cycle. Oh, by the way, automobiles, crushed cars. Every year, we crush 10 million cars. We re recycle part of it. Rest of them are ending up in the landfill as fluff. And by the way, this is like party, OK? Now, wait for the party. India and China are going to join this party now. They are in the process of joining and what we are going to create. So, so these are all uh, speaks for itself on where our design, human-centered design process is leading to. All right? Well, there's more. Uh, we create artificial mountains from dust and sand and gravel. Diodes. You can buy these cheap lights, flashlights, with 10, 12 of them. That's what happens after that. Well, this is an interesting um, photograph taken by Chris Jordan in a place called Midway, which is an island 2,000 miles away from any continent It's in the Pacific Ocean. 2,000 miles away. Albatross, these seabirds, pick up the plastic. Somehow ends up there. They pick up the plastic and feed their babies because they think it's food. And they get ingested by plastic, and this is what happens to those birds a little later. That's what human-centered design is leading to, right? Now, this is more recent. So all these great engineering achievements, gadgets we produce, is actually not sustainable, as you can see. It is not leading to productive harmony that I talked about. It is, it is, it is kind of trying to maximize our time in a way without any consideration for anything else. So where do we go from here? Janine talked about the time on a 4.5 billion year. It's very difficult for most of us to make <coughs> that kind of time frame. It's very difficult. It's a long time. So what I have done here is take the 4.6 billion years and put it into 12 months. So January 1st, 9, 2012, Earth is born. Today is April 19th. Where are we? Somewhere up there. By the way, we are not there suddenly. Birds are not there. Mammals are not there. Fish not there. Photosynthesis is somewhere up there. All right? If you come close to us, four million years ago, hominin, and these are all the, our ancestors who walked on two legs. And when did they arrive at the scene? On 12-31-2012, not yet here. At 4 p.m., 4.24 p.m., eight hours before midnight, okay? So that's still not the modern human being. When did we come? Well, Homo sapiens, if you consider them as modern human being, in fact, probably you wouldn't differentiate a Homo, homo sapien if you traveled back in time 50,000 years ago. Maybe if you go to the beach, they would have been naked, but stronger than us because probably they were active. <laughs> but anyhow, <laughs> when did that happen? 11.54 p.m., six minutes to midnight. We are not there yet. Well, if we consider all these developments, modern technology that we have is, is the recent 200 years development. If we consider we are at that moment, look at the time, 11.59 p.m. One second we are on this planet. Just one second. And we think we have created a society that is sustainable. We think whatever we do is, is, is something that no other organism can do. And that alliance is what makes things worse. In fact, as an engineer, I will round this up here, not there. 
We better truncate our species is not there. See? So, where do we go from here? Can we learn from this wise nature? Wise people are older, they have seen tragedies, they have seen successes. We get advice from them. Here is something. 4.6 years, billion years old, of his 3.8 years of life. And we don't need human center design. We need to move on to a life center design. A life center design means our working environment is not my problem in hand. The working environment is Earth. And our operating conditions are sunlight, air, water, and gravity. And we have some intersecting variables because anything that we do affects others. That would be a variable that has to be considered. We cannot design something in vacuum for the benefit of a section of a people or in the name of human centered design that we do something saying that it benefits the whole world. And there's a limit on resources. Right? So that's a life centered design. And if we follow life centered design, we will reach sustainability automatically because sustainability is not about surviving, it's not about our survival. It's about us thriving together with every species that's out there. That's what life centered design is all about. So if you look at nature, Janine's speech talked about different things. Are you talking about temperature control? Of course it's there. Are you talking about aerodynamics? Of course. I mean, drilling, pumping, anything that you can think of, nature has done it. So I was thinking, you know, I'm, I'm an engineer, you know, I always say all these things, but then I think, hmm, I gotta find something that nature doesn't do. It seems like nature has solved all the problems that you want to solve. Energy conversion, energy storage, water storage, water collection, pumping, drilling, what? I'm an engineer. Hmm. Automobile, nature doesn't have automobile. Suspension, oh. So I asked a student of mine a few weeks ago, a few months ago, hey, Go check it out. Nature probably doesn't do suspension in our sock of job. Come back and tell me if she does. So he comes back to me a week later. Dr. Java, I studied this. You got brain, right? I said, I thought I saw. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I didn't mean that. The brain, it is actually covered by liquid to protect it from all the shocks that your head is going through. So it's their sock of job. Yeah, so nature does sock of absorption, but I was totally convinced that he goes on to say, you know, egg, the yolk in the egg is actually surrounded by this white egg, and it cannot sink to the bottom. It should not flow to the top. It is suspended, and it is done in a way nicely to absorb all the shocks, so it stays where it is. Wow, that's interesting. I never thought about, about egg. I like to eat egg, but I never thought about it. Cricket, the little creatures. They jump far, and when they land, they have specially designed legs that have got uh, some kind of a liquid inside protecting them shocks. Well, that looks a little bit more advanced than what we do in the car. Fleas, they actually jump and fall on their head, and their exoskeleton absorbs all the shock. Resonant, he said, you know, I'll give you an example of non insects, you know, the nuts. They fall from 70 meters, 80 meters, that's like over 200 feet, no problem, they don't break. Then he comes back and says, you know, my favorite is cassowary. I said, what is it? It sounds like some kind of a food item. You know, cassowary is a big flightless bird. These birds are in Australia, and they are five feet long, tall. They run at 50 kilometers an hour, over 30 miles an hour. When they run, they sometimes run into trees. Sometimes they hit, their, hit the trees for fruits. And they, I mean, there are no such birds out there. It's an amazing bird. And the helmet that you see there, it takes tremendous amount of shock, and we model that shock under six kilo newton. And it actually, what it does is, it, 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 it is a flexible element deforming not more than what we do in our bumper design, where a rigid element deforms less. Beautiful design. And we never even thought about it. So nature does do suspension. Nature does suck absorption. And, and there's more. I asked a student to study about non-permanent joints, and he's studying you know, limpets. An organism that are in intertidal zones, um, staying on the rocks, which are uneven surfaces, and they can stay there like a rock. And you try to pull them, you, they will, they will die. They won't come out. But if they want to, they can. And we have to use epoxies and hot movements and things like that. Can we learn from that? So there is quite a bit of uh, learning that we have to do from nature. This is one of my favorites. Look at starlings flocking. Can you design that? 
How do you do that? How, what is these birds are doing? Hundreds of them, thousands of them, moving in formation. Look at there is music, there is dance, there is beauty, there is elegance, there is speed. They make sharp turns. They don't collide with each other. There is complete harmony. They got everything that we want to have, but we don't. How do they do that? Engineers tried to model it. It was very difficult. But then it was found. They follow some simple rules. If you try to model as a whole, it doesn't work. But if you do something very simple, put a little rule saying that every bird keeps a minimum distance from other birds, keep away. One rule. Follow the same species of the same color. Two or three such rules, immediately this becomes a beauty. Now we have understood simple rules make this complex behavior. In fact, movies like Lion King and Finding Nemo use the same order. We could learn from nature, all right? So, from, so what are the important strategies or simple things that we can learn from nature? I believe if you follow some fundamental principles, we can do life-centered design. One of the design is local, keep it local. Any solution you find should be local. Because it is local, there is diversity. You don't, engineers are trying to standardize everything. So you go to every different country, everything looks the same these days because you lost the uniqueness of places. So if you want a solution to be sustainable, it should be local. That means local resources available, local expertise is available, material is available, and the diversity is maintained. Periodic, this is my favorite. Everything in nature is periodic. Life is periodic. Our period of a living organism is the lifespan. Nature renews itself. Periodic table of elements is periodic. Seasons are periodic. You can predict periodic. Why is it periodicity is important? Because you can predict things. You can say, when will be the hurricane season? Day and night is periodic. Anything that is not periodic can lead to disaster. Nature is in dynamic equilibrium. <coughs> Therefore, it is periodic. So what we design should be periodic, meaning it should be completely recyclable. It goes back into the system. That's what periodic means. Finally, optimize. Nature doesn't maximize. Maximizing is trying to get the most out of it. It is trying to exploit something. Optimizing is trying to get the best out of it. So it's a combination of various things, and you find a solution that is best. It is not mathematical model. It is life-centered design. Thank you.